I'd like to close a gap that we have left open in chapter 2 on induction and recursion. That is in slide 12, uh, the issue of comparing cardinalities. Okay, so we want to prove two lemmas. Uh, both of them deal with the issue of how to compare cardinalities of um, two sets. So we have here two sets, A and B. We're considering the case in which these two sets are finite sets. And we consider the uh, condition in which we have a function f, whose domain is A, its range is B, and f happens to be 1 to 1. I remind you, 1 to 1 means that you cannot have two different arguments that map to the same value in B. Okay, under this condition, we want to prove that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B. Namely, A does not have more elements than B does. Good, let's see how we prove this claim. Okay, so this is our theorem. Sorry, problems. Our function F is a one-to-one -one function from A to B. Both A and B have finite uh, cardinalities. We want to prove that under this condition, the cardinality of A is bounded by the cardinality of B. The proof is by induction on A, on the number of elements in A. The induction basis for A, which equals zero elements, namely A is empty, it's the empty set. In this case, we clearly have that the cardinality of B is it greater than or equal to zero, because the cardinality of a set can never be negative. So when A has zero elements, we immediately have that, regardless of the function f actually, we immediately have that the cardinality of A is bounded by the cardinality of B. Now you may ask, what does it mean to have a function whose domain is empty. In fact, a one-to-one -one function whose domain is empty. Well, what this means is that the function f itself is empty. There are no pairs in the function f. But this issue, although interesting, uh, is uh, not essential for the correctness of the induction basis. Okay, let's move on to the induction hypothesis. Let's assume that the theorem holds for A that contains n elements. And now, in the induction step, we want to prove that the theorem holds for a set A that contains n plus 1 elements. Okay. Let's try to move it. Good. What we do is as follows. We pick an element x in A, any element you want, and look at the following diagram. We have the set A, we have the set B, we have a function f that maps A to B, and this function happens to be 1 to 1. Right? Now, we have picked an arbitrary element x in A, and we look at its image, which is y. Right? Here's y. y equals f of x. Now, let's define a prime to be the set a minus the set that contains x. Namely, a prime contains all the elements in a except for x. We drop x out of a. b prime, similarly, is the set b minus the image of f, minus y. Okay, minus actually the set that contains y. Good. So we have two subsets, a prime and b prime. Now, consider g, which is a restriction of f to the domain a prime. Okay. Now, g, by definition, is a function whose domain is a prime, and its range is b. Now, I wrote here b prime instead of b. I wrote a stronger statement. I'm saying g is actually a function 
whose range is B prime. Let's see why this is true. You take any Z in A prime, and you look at what is G of Z. We want to show that G of Z has to be in B prime. Well, by definition, G of Z equals F of Z. It's a restriction. Now, Z does not equal X, because we took Z from A prime, and A prime does not contain X. Good. So, Z and X are distinct, and F is 1 to 1. So, F of Z does not equal F of X. This implies that the range of G is contained in B, not including F of X, because for every Z, G of Z does not equal F of X. Now, this is exactly B prime. Hence, the range of G is B prime as required. Okay, now, what else can we say about G? We claim that G is 1 to 1. Why is G 1 to 1? Well, the reasoning is very simple. If G is not 1 to 1, then F is not 1 to 1, and that would contradict our assumption that F is 1 to 1. Recall, we assume that F is 1 to 1. Good. Let's go back. So we have G, which is a function from A prime, A prime to B prime, and it's 1 to 1. We apply the induction hypothesis to G, because A prime contains n elements, one element less than A. A contained n plus 1 elements, therefore A prime contains n elements. We can apply the induction hypothesis to G. The induction hypothesis says that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality, sorry, the cardinality of A prime is less than or equal to the cardinality of B prime. Okay, we're done. The cardinality of A equals the cardinality of A prime plus 1, because the only difference in the cardinalities between A prime and A is 1, because we've omitted one element, x. Now, by the induction hypothesis, A prime has no more elements than B prime. Good. And B prime, the cardinality of B prime plus 1, is exactly the cardinality of B by this equality. Good. So we have that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B, and we're done. Let's go back to the second lemma. The second lemma says that if I have two finite sets, A and B, and there exists a one, an onto function, not, not an one-to-one -one as before, but an onto function from A to B, then the cardinality of A is greater than or equal to the cardinality of B. Okay. How do we prove this lemma? Let's go back to the handwritten proof. <coughs> so, we have a function f. It's from a to b. It's on to. The cardinalities of a and b are finite. We want to prove that the cardinality of a is not less than the cardinality of b. Now, I uh, strongly encourage you to try to prove this by induction on A, uh, you'll see that you'll get stuck. And therefore, the proof I will introduce is a proof on induction on the cardinality of B on the range. OK, let's start with the basis. When B is empty, it has zero elements. Then clearly, the cardinality of A is greater than or equal to zero. As before, you might ask, what does it mean to have a function which happens to be on to? and whose domain is empty. What does that mean? It doesn't even look like a function, because it seems that I might have elements x and a for which f of x cannot be defined, because it cannot be in the empty set. Well, that, of course, would mean that the set a itself is empty. But, again, I want to emphasize, this is not an important remark for the correctness of the basis of the induction basis. The induction basis simply holds because if you have a set B which is empty, then the set A cannot have less than zero elements, and this is exactly what we wanted to prove. And with that, we're done. Good. Now, the induction hypothesis says that the theorem holds for sets B of cardinality N, and we want to prove the induction step for sets B of cardinality N plus 1. Okay, how do we prove it by induction on the cardinality of B? What we do now is we pick an arbitrary element y, this time in b. 
So again, look at the diagram. We have the set A, we have the set, we have the set B, we have the function f mapping A to B. This function happens to be on to. Great. We picked an arbitrary element y and b. Now let us define f minus 1 of y. Please do not be confused. I'm not assuming here that the function f is invertible in any way. What I'm doing here is I'm defining the pre-image of f. So this is the pre-image of f with respect to y, of course. It's simply the set of all x's in A, all the elements in the domain of the function, that map to y, namely that f of x equals y. Okay, so this is the definition of the pre-image of y. Okay, so here I depicted the pre-image of, of y, and I call it f minus y, f minus 1 of y, and you notice that this is a subset of A. Now I define A prime to be A minus the pre-image of Y, and B prime to be B minus the set that contains Y. I define G to be the restriction of F to the domain A prime, and I claim that G is a function from A prime to B prime. Let's try to understand why. It's a function because it's a restriction. The range, you could say, should equal B rather than B prime, but notice We've omitted from A prime all the elements that map to Y. Therefore, G of Z can never equal Y, and therefore the range of G is indeed contained in B prime. Now, second claim about G is that G is onto. Why is G onto? Well, G is onto simply because if G is not onto, then F is not onto. If we can find an element W in B, over here, which G does not map to, then F also does not have an incoming arrow into that W, which would contradict the fact that we assume that F is onto. So G is onto because F is onto. Good. We're nearly done with the proof. Since F is onto, the preimage of Y cannot be empty, because if it were empty, if no element would map to y, then f would not be onto. So the preimage cannot be empty, and if the preimage is not empty, then a prime contains at least one element less than a, because we remove the preimage of y from a in order to obtain a prime. So the cardinality of a prime is less than or equal to the cardinality of a minus 1. Therefore, the cardinality of a is greater than or equal to the cardinality of a prime, a prime plus 1. This is just, you know, moving things from one side to the other. Now I apply the induction hypothesis to G. G is an onto function from A prime to B prime. The cardinality of B prime is 1 minus the cardinality of B, so I can apply the induction hypothesis to G. It tells me that the cardinality of A prime is greater than or equal to the cardinality of B prime, and the cardinality of B is exactly the cardinality of B prime plus 1. And this completes the proof because I have obtained that the cardinality of A is greater than or equal to the cardinality of B. Good. Let's go back to the slide number 13. Slide number 13 uh, is about the pigeonhole principle. And what it says, the pigeonhole principle, it says that if I have a function f and which maps a to the set 1 to n, okay, so this is my, uh, this is my function f, and it maps a to the set 1 to n, I think of a as pigeons, and I think of the set 1 to n as um, cells in which the pigeons uh, go to sleep. I forgot the word now in English for the th this box uh, full of cells in which the pigeons go to sleep at night. Okay, so now I have more pigeons than cells, and the question is, will I have a separate cell, a distinct cell for every pigeon? And the answer is, I cannot have one, because 
this function f, which tells me in which cell each pigeon goes to sleep, cannot be one to one. This is because the set A has more elements than N. This is what the, theory, the principle says. Namely, there must be two pigeons, A1 and A2, distinct, A1 does not equal A2, such that the cell that pigeon A1 goes to sleep in is the same as the cell that pigeon A2 goes to sleep in. Okay, so how do we prove the, pigeon the pigeonhole principle? Good. What do we know? We have a mathematical principle, which is called contrapositive. What does the contrapositive tell us? It tells us that condition P implies condition Q if and only if the negation of condition Q implies the negation of condition P. Now, very often we think of this principle as the principle of proof by contradiction. Let's try to understand why. Suppose we want to prove that P implies Q. Then how do we prove it by contradiction? We say, let's assume that P holds and Q does not hold. Let us show that if Q does not hold, then P does not hold. And then we get a contradiction because on one side P holds and on the other side P does not hold. That would be our contradiction. So this principle of proof by contrapositive is sometimes known to you as proof by contradiction. Okay, now we know that if there exists a function from A to B that is one to one, then the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B. So let, let us denote by P the condition that there exists a function from A to B that is one to one. Let us denote by Q the condition that the cardinality of A is less than or equal to the cardinality of B. Now let's negate P and Q. The negation of Q is that the cardinality of A is greater than the cardinality of B. The negation of P is that there does not exist a one-to-one -one function from A to B. Namely, every function from A to B cannot be one-to-one. -one. Now, the, the principle of contrapositive tells us that P implies Q implies not Q implies not P. Namely, if A is greater than B, then every function from A to B is not one-to-one. -one. And this is exactly the pigeonhole, the pigeonhole principle. Let's see. We have here a set A, which is greater than the set B. B here is simply the set 1, 2, N. Therefore, the function, any function, f from a to the set 1 to n, cannot be 1 to 1. And this is exactly what the pigeonhole principle says. Thank you very much.